Hello, I'm Laura Cleaver. I'm the Principal Investigator of the Cultivate Manuscript Project, which is based at the University of London and funded by the European Research Council. The project examines the international trade in medieval manuscripts between about 1900 and 1945 and thinks that about the impact that this has had, not only on where manuscripts are now, but how they've been understood and studied. Today, I'm going to talk about one tiny aspect of this research, focusing on one individual dealer, Wilfred Voynich. I'm recording this in October 2020, when the research of the project is about 18 months old. So we will doubtless refine some of the findings that I'm presenting here over the coming months. In manuscript studies, the name Voynich is now most closely associated with this manuscript, Beinecke Library 408. This is an unusual manuscript containing images, diagrams and text, apparently in a cipher that has so far defied all attempts to make sense of it. The mystery around this object was deliberately exploited by the man after whom it is named, Wilfred Michael Voynich. In a lecture in Philadelphia in 1921, Voynich claimed that he had found the manuscript in an ancient castle in Southern Europe in 1912. Many other remarkable claims were made about the book as Voynich tried to sell it in America. For example, in 1921, the Alexandria Gazette reported that Voynich was to give an address in which he would reveal secrets locked up by Roger Bacon, the 13th century wizard adding that, beyond explaining that two of the pages have to do with the origin of life, Dr. de Voynich refused to discuss the contents of the book. When the time comes, he said, I will prove to the world that the black magic of the Middle Ages consisted in discoveries far in advance of 20th century science. My subject here is not the cipher manuscript, but rather Voynich's place in the transatlantic trade in such books. The archival materials from his New York office, now preserved at the Grolier Club, provide an opportunity to go beyond the myths that Voynich and those around him perpetuated and to examine the actions of Voynich and his American clients. They also are, allow a reappraisal of the idea of America as a voracious market for manuscripts before the Wall Street crash of 1929 and the subsequent economic depression of the 1930s. Although Voynich did achieve some high profits on individual manuscripts sold in America, in the 1920s his business struggled and ultimately proved unsustainable. At the time of his death in 1930, the Cipher manuscript and many other volumes remained unsold in his American stock. In addition, some of the manuscripts that Voynich took to America returned to Europe, demonstrating that the trade was not only in one direction. Accounts of Voynich's early life, written long after the events described, bear comparison with dramatic novels, and this may, in part, be due to his relationship with the novelist Ethel Ball. Ethel changed her surname to Voynich in 1896, and the couple married in 1902. Wilfried Voynich was born in Polish Lithuania in 1865. He claimed to have studied at the universities of Warsaw and Moscow before being exiled to Siberia for revolutionary activities. According to one obituary, his intimate friends who have heard from his lips the story of his Siberian experiences will never forget the impression. In one tale, Voynich caught a glimpse of Ethel from his imprisonment in Warsaw during her visit to Poland in 1887 and subsequently recognised her when he got to London. However, this appears to be recorded only in an article published after everyone involved was dead and which is full of other inaccuracies. On firmer ground, uh, Wilfred and Ethel, claiming to be married, appear in the 1901 census. They were then living in Great Russell Mansions, opposite the British Museum. Voynich described himself as a bookseller and bibliographer, and Ethel as a novelist and author. The origins of Voynich's bookselling business were also mythologised. Millicent Sowerby, who worked for Voynich from 1912, published an autobiography in 1967 in which she claimed that Voynich had borrowed half a crown from a friend to start his business. She also described Voynich as having the head and shoulders of a great Norwegian god, borrowing a phrase from one of Ethel's novels. As Jerry Kennedy observed, an alternative theory for the origins of Voynich's business might take into account that Ethel's novel, The Gadfly, published in 1897, had been a bestseller. Indeed, in an article in the New York Tribune of 1901, Voynich was described as the husband of the author of The Gadfly. 
Moreover, the catalogues produced by Voynich, each priced at half a crown, indicates that he was initially in business with one Charles Edgell, although by 1900, Edgell had withdrawn from the business and left London. In 1900, Voynich opened a shop at 1 Soho Square, London. He'd been issuing lists of books for sale since 1898, at first including only printed books, although in a second list published in 1900, he mentioned that I have a few manuscripts, including part of an English Lollard Bible in octavo size and a set of antiphonals, etc., from a Dominican monastery in Tuscany. The following year, he stated, it is in contemplation to issue from time to time lists of manuscripts for sale, fully described by a competent authority. It is not intended to restrict these lists to high priced or finely illuminated manuscripts, but to include any medieval or classical manuscripts of literary or historical interest likely to be useful to scholars. At this date, Voynich was probably not in a position to buy many expensive illuminated manuscripts, and throughout his career he invested in manuscripts that he felt would appeal to academics and those interested in science. From 1903, his lists were succeeded by a new series of short catalogues of books and manuscripts, and in 1904 Voynich moved the business to 68 Shaftesbury Avenue, a few doors down from Frank Savin's shop and closer to other booksellers. Accounts of Voynich's business have focused on the idea that he bought books cheaply on the continent and sold them for large profits in London. An article in the Times in 1901 claimed for the past few years he has been sweeping Italy and other continental towns and cities and the crop has certainly been a remarkably good one. In 1904, an article in the Tatler reported that he bought from government collections or monastic institutions in out-of-the-way places. However, the evidence for manuscripts traded by Voynich in the first decade of the century is much less exotic. One of Voynich's customers in this period was Henry Wellcome, an American resident in London who had made a fortune through the sale of pharmaceuticals. In 1905, Voynich sold Wellcome a 15th century collection of medical texts for three pounds and five shillings. This manuscript had previously been sold at Sotheby's in London in 1903 for one pound and one shilling. Similarly, eight manuscripts sold by Voynich to Wellcome in 1909 had all been on the London market in the previous decade. Voynich does not seem to have bought many items at auctions in London in this period and instead acquired books from other dealers. In 1901, Voynich's list of books for sale indicated that customers could have repairs made or rebinding done by J and J Layton, and Voynich also bought books from the firm. In 1909, he acquired a 15th century manuscript from Leighton for £25, selling it four days later to Welcome for £35, a reminder that profits could be made without leaving London. Tall stories were not unusual in the book trade in the early 20th century. In December 1899, as Voynich was establishing his business, Bernard Quaritch, the leading dealer in medieval manuscripts and another bookseller originally from continental Europe, died. Newspaper obituaries likened Quaritch to Wellington, Bismarck and Hercules, and during his lifetime Quaritch had been described as the Napoleon of bookselling. In the aftermath of his death, the press focused on high prices Quaritch had paid for books, as well as the claim that he had worn the same hat for 24 years. It is possible, therefore, that consciously or unconsciously, Voynich and Ethel sought to develop a similar reputation for Voynich and his business. Quaritch also provided a precedent for Voynich in having courted an American clientele. Quaritch's son, Bernard Alfred, had visited America in 1890 with an exhibition of books for sale, including 30 manuscripts, which he had taken to New York, Boston, Chicago and Philadelphia. Although few manuscripts were sold on this trip, he did serve to expand Quaritch's client base, and by the end of the century, Americans, including Robert Ho and Carl Edelheim, were buying manuscripts through Quaritch. One notable sale during Quaritch's time in America was that of the Golden Gospels of Henry VIII, described as an 8th century manuscript on purple parchment, which was acquired by Theodore Irwin. In 1900, Irwin's manuscripts were acquired via two intermediate sales by the banker J.P. Morgan. In 1902, in Britain, Morgan acquired another collection, that of the Lancashire cotton bleacher and chemical manufacturer Richard Bennett, which in turn included part of the collection built by William Morris. 
This prompted the Times to ask whether nothing could be done to stem the continuous and wholesale exportation of rare early printed and other books and illuminated manuscripts to the United States of America. The author speculated that this might be the most important single transaction which has occurred, or perhaps is likely to occur, a hope that was to prove overly optimistic, as more libraries were sold in the following decades. In 1911, a cartoon in Puck magazine showed Morgan with a giant magnet in the form of a dollar sign, attracting the world's treasures, including books, to New York. In 1914, plausibly fearing the consequences for his life in London and disrupted access to the continent caused by the First World War, but also attracted by the potential of the American market, Voynich turned his eyes to the United States. By this time, his advertising boasted of offices in London, Paris, Florence and Vienna. In November 1914, Voynich sailed from Liverpool on the Lusitania, describing himself as a dealer in manuscripts. He brought with him at least, um, he brought with him rare books and manuscripts, including the Cypher manuscript. Echoing Bernard Alfred Quaritch's actions a quarter of a century earlier, he set off on a tour of American cities. And this map shows the battlefronts of the First World War overlaid onto the United States, giving a sense of the relative scale of the areas involved. Voynich's tour was more ambitious than Quaritch's had been and focused on, in, on institutions rather than individual buyers. Having spent some time in Washington, in March 1915, Voynich arrived in Baltimore, where he informed a re reporter from the Baltimore Sun that he knew a great deal about Baltimore, clarifying, at least I know of two very famous things, Johns Hopkins University and the Sun. Voynich's approach seems to have been to try to attract press attention and court the interest of universities and museums. Again, Voynich teased the press with the romance of his manuscript's origins, declaring that, through papers which came into his possession, he learned of the existence of a large number of valuable manuscripts in Austria, which had been hastily removed from central Italy at the time of Napoleon's first invasion in the last decade of the 18th century. They were found at last in a castle belonging to a distinguished member of the nobility. Their existence was unknown to the owner. The chests in which they were stored had not been opened for over a century. In addition to Washington and Baltimore, Voynich took his books to New York, Philadelphia, Minneapolis and Cleveland, arriving in Chicago in October 1915. By the time of Voynich's arrival in Chicago, the Bulletin of the Art Institute was able to report that the Art Institute has already been fortunate in acquiring for its permanent collections the Canterbury Manuscript of the Latin Bible, an example of early 13th century art. However, the presence of the exhibition was an opportunity to encourage the Institute's supporters to finance the acquisition of further items. In November, the bulletin reported that popular interest in a special exhibition has seldom been greater than in the collection of manuscripts and early printed books belonging to Mr. W. M. Voynich of London, adding that it stirred the imagination of the non-erudite as well as the scholar and artist. Mrs. Frank G. Logan bought and presented to the Institute a 14th century description of the world. Mrs. John J. Borland gave two manuscripts, a Horace and a Book of Hours. The Institute was also able to acquire six more manuscripts. These were four books of hours, a volume of psalms and hymns, and a spectacular cycle of 58 full-page images, perhaps made to preface the Psalter. The bulletin declared, it is hoped that these fine manuscripts will form the foundation of an important manuscript collection. Yet although further gifts were obtained and more purchases made from Voynich in the following years, the manuscript collection at the Art Institute remained small, with just 18 manuscripts, together with some detached leaves and cuttings, by the time of Seymour de Ricci's census of manuscripts in America in 1937. All the manuscripts imported by Voynich to America were given a new stock number, generated in ascending order. One of the Chicago purchases, A Book of Hours, can be identified as stock number A18 in the surviving catalogue descriptions preserved in the Voynich archive now in the Grolier Club. The manuscript was priced by Voynich at $4,000, approximately £200. I've not been able to trace the earlier history of this manuscript, but not all the manuscripts acquired by the Art Institute had been found in an Austrian castle, which was later revealed to be cover for the Jesuit Library in Rome. 
the image cycle, here with scenes of Noah's Ark, had appeared in the famous exhibition at the Burlington Fine Arts Club in London in 1908, when it was part of the collection of Alfred Huff. From Chicago, Voynich went on to the University of Michigan, the University of Illinois, Buffalo and Detroit. The Detroit Times estimated the value of the collection to be a million dollars and, presumably following Voynich's direction, drew attention to two manuscripts that remained unsolved, the Cypher manuscript and this manuscript, a volume of the lives of the Desert Fathers with miniatures said to be attributed to Giotto or Lorenzetto. In this detail, Paul the Hermit is attacked by insects and tempted by a harlot in the form of an attractive woman with horns standing for the devil. To ensure that his flesh does not give way to the woman's advances, Paul bites off the end of his tongue and spits it at the woman, and that's just visible here. Attributions to artists such as Giotto, although now usually discredited, were not uncommon at the time, and underline Voynich's attempts to sell these books as works of art. In February 1916, Voynich left his remaining stock at the Library of Congress and returned to London. After 15 months away, he presumably spent some time putting his affairs in order, and he obtained new stock, buying more manuscripts from Leighton. During his time in London, Voynich also had to respond to an action brought by the Dean and Chapter of Lincoln Cathedral, which alleged that an early printed volume, then in Voynich's possession, was stolen property. Voynich claimed that he had bought the book in New York for $300, suggesting that he was already buying books as well as selling them in America. Once it was identified that the book was stolen from, uh, was that stolen from Lincoln a few years earlier, Voynich agreed to return it to the Cathedral Library. He then sailed for America for a second time in May 1916. On his return to America, Voynich described himself as an art expert. The American Art News reported that he was to give a course of lectures on his speciality of old illuminated and art illustrated manuscripts and books in universities of the Middle West. And that he has brought with him on his present trip from England, which will last 10 weeks, a further selection from his collection of illuminated manuscripts and precious books. Back in America, Voynich reclaimed um, his manuscripts and books from the Library of Congress and arranged the sale of the supposed Giotto manuscript to Morgan, reportedly for $70,000, or about £14,000, an immense sum which may have helped finance his gift to the University of Chicago to support a chair in Polish history for three years. At the end of his 10-week tour, Voynich returned to Britain, but he was back in the United States in November 1916 for another lecture tour. The American Art News observed, book lovers always await his arrival with the knowledge that he will bring with him something of more than usual interest and rarity. Voynich now opened a New York office in Aelian Hall, around the corner from the New York Public Library. However, in 1917, he was once again on the road, journeying to Pittsburgh and Detroit with an exhibition of books, and to Chicago to give a lecture entitled How to Study 15th Century Books. Even after the Great War had ended, Voynich spent most of each year in America, returning to Europe every summer. The records preserved in the Grolier Club provide insights into these trips. For example, they document Voynich's entertainment of other booksellers and clients, including, in 1924, lunches with the dealers Francis Edwards, Mags and Dring of Bernard Quaritch Limited. Other expenses included rail and plane fares for travel around Europe, as well as costs for having books packed into trunks, taxis, tips, and um, including in 1926 excess luggage charges and a tip to the man who weighed the luggage. Although these trips echo the foundation of Voynich's business on books bought cheaply on the European continent, he seems now to have acquired most of his books from dealers, for example, purchasing manuscripts in London from Francis Edwards and the firm Davis and Orioni. Each return to America with new stock can be understood as the start of a new season for the business, although ships of book, shipments of books and manuscripts were also dispatched to America by the London office between Voynich's visits. The system of numbering the new stock allows for an assessment of the business in the 1920s. By 1919, Voynich's stock numbers had reached three and a half thousand. 
suggesting that he imported roughly 800 of volumes a year, each year since 1916. Between Vonich's visits to Britain in 1919 and 1920, about 850 items were added to the American stock, including at least 11 manuscripts. In 1920 to 21, the overall total was more modest and included about 10 manuscripts. These numbers suggest a fairly healthy business, possibly with Voynich still filling out his stock in 1919 to 20. In 1920 to 22, the number of new editions fell to about 334 with at least four manuscripts. However, from 1922 to three, the numbers fell again. In that year, only about 155 items seem to have been added to the American stock, including seven manuscripts. The following years saw a slight increase with about 258 items and seven manuscripts in 1923 to four, 227 items, including 22 manuscripts in 1924 to five, and a, a further 25 manuscripts imported in 1925 to six as part of a total of about 298 items. Of course, a very small number of expensive books could still be profitable, but it seems that the business was struggling with no trip to Europe in 1927. Letters from Anne Nill, Voynich's assistant in New York to Herbert Garland, who was running the London branch of the business, shed further light on the circumstances. Nill suggests a need to find new clients to replace those who were elderly or had died, and, to, and the challenges of shifting the stock particularly in Kianabula. They did manage a trip to Europe in 1928, but on their return, it became evident that Voynich was unwell. And from that point onwards, the letters between Nell and Garland are full of concerns about money with debts to many other London book dealers and Voynich's health. As the graph makes clear, medieval manuscripts were a very small part of Voynich's business. Only 140 of the books recorded in the surviving American stock records for the 1920s can be firmly identified as manuscripts, representing just over 4% of items. While this is probably an underestimate, given, to gaps, given um, the gaps in the stock records, for the years that have the most complete data, the figure is still below 10%. The increased number of manuscripts brought to America in 1924 and 1925 was probably in response to particular clients, notably Robert Garrett, a banker and Olympic medalist, and the University of Michigan. Following a stop in Michigan on his 1915 exhibition tour, Voynich had returned there with an exhibition staged to celebrate the opening of a new library building in 1920. At the same time, the average value of the manuscripts, as declared to US Customs, increased over this decade. This is not particularly surprising given that the market for manuscripts was booming in the 1920s, but it shows Voynich increasingly willing to invest in expensive manuscripts, presumably with some degree of confidence that he could sell them. Two of the lists of books and manuscripts prepared for customs, those for 1925 and 1926, are annotated in pencil with prices in dollars. In this period, a pound was worth a little less than five dollars, and all the annotations are figures significantly larger than a direct conversion of the valuation of pounds into dollars. This graph shows the prices declared to customs in pounds in blue with each bar representing one manuscript from the sample for 1925 and 1926. The annotated figures found on the inventories divided by five to convert them into rough pound equivalent values are here shown in orange. And it seems plausible that these were the prices Voynich hoped to raise in America. It is one thing to dream of riches while contemplating an inventory, it is another to actually sell manuscripts. From the information preserved in the Grolier Club, it is possible to trace what happened to many of the volumes imported to America in the 1920s. Sticking with the sample for 1925 to 6, we have the actual sale prices for some of the manuscripts. The sale prices are shown here in grey. Like the annotated dollar prices, these have been divided by five to bring them roughly into line with the value of the British pound. The data is not complete, but two clear trends are evident. One is that, with one exception, 
the sale prices are all below the prices annotated on the customs lists and not by any obviously consistent measure. The other is that the sale prices nevertheless represent a good profit. So why was the business struggling? It is worth reiterating that manuscripts were only a small part of the business and Nils' letters suggest that they were having particular problems in the later 1920s finding buyers for early printed books and an incunabula in particular. However, the answer in part lies in some of the gaps in the data on this graph, because not all the manuscripts sold within Voynich's lifetime. Taking the same sample of manuscripts from 1925 to 6, this graph shows the number of months where known that each volume remained in stock, capped at the point of Voynich's death in March 1930. Once again, the data is incomplete, and it might be possible to further refine it through material in archives at Princeton and Michigan, where some of the books now are. But of the 51 manuscripts in this sample, at least 16, 31%, took a year or more to sell, and at least 9, 18%, had not sold after three years. We can, of course, use the data to see if there's a correlation between price and the time taken to sell. There are examples of manuscripts that sold quickly, having been valued at both high prices and relatively low ones, but there is no obvious correlation between price and speed of sale. The most expensive manuscript in this set, a collection of works on astronomy and geometry, was sold after 18 months to Robert Garrett for $4,750, discounted from an asking price of $5,000. The lack of clear correlation between time in stock and sale price is probably linked to the unique qualities of each manuscript and the specific demands of a relatively small number of buyers. In the 1925 to 6 sample, five of the manuscripts were apparently bought very quickly by the University of Michigan and may have been brought from London in response to a specific request. Six were bought by Robert Garrett, but over a much longer time period. Indeed, in 1928, Nil reported to Garland that Garrett had arranged to pay for the books he wanted through a monthly payment plan of $500, later increased to $750. Although in December 1928, she calculated that at that rate, he would only clear his current debt in February 1932. Four manuscripts from this sample went to the Morgan Library, to whom Voynich sent manuscripts for consideration, often without success. In 1928, Nil wrote to Garland with a hint of desperation. We tried out the Morgan Library this week, but had no luck. I think I can dig up one more lot of books and manuscripts for the Morgan, but I don't feel optimistic. I don't think there's anything that we have that they will be interested in. However, from time to time, they do such unexpected things that it seems worthwhile trying. The volumes bought by the Morgan Library from the 1925 to 6 shipments were all highly illuminated, including these 15th century Italian books, of which M726 and M721 had been obtained in London after the auction of British collections. Another two manuscripts from the 1925 to 6 shipments returned to London to the firm Mags Brothers, and two institutions and four individuals purchased one each from this set, although all these buyers also acquired other manuscripts from Voynich at other times. Again, we can look for a correlation between price and buyer. On this graph, I've just identified four major clients to try and make the graph legible, and these are the values declared at import rather than the sale prices to look at the largest available data set. I've also expanded the time frame to take into account all the records from between 1919 and 1928. Some patterns are discernible. Robert Garrett regularly bought highly priced manuscripts as well as cheap ones. The Morgan Library bought no very cheap manuscripts, while the University of Michigan bought one manuscript valued at more than £100 and subsequently cheaper volumes. Particularly striking in this set is Grenville Kane whose collection is now at Princeton. He began by buying relatively inexpensive manuscripts, but paid progressively higher prices, roughly in line with the general trend line here. The challenge of selling manuscripts is further de demonstrated in the Voynich archival materials by the inclusion of manuscripts with low stock numbers in later customs declarations. 
the graphs I've shown you here only included stock newly imported to America. But in 1925, Voynich's customs declaration included four manuscripts against which it was noted that they had been taken to London in August 1925 and brought back. One of these, a 15th century copy of Justinus, had the stock number 724, suggesting that it was first imported during the First World War. It had previously appeared in London at auction in 1912 when it was bought by Leighton for £17. Voynich appears to have initially valued it at £35, although the price declared in 1925 was £50. He finally managed to sell the manuscript to the London Dean and Mags Brothers in 1929 for $388, about £78, reduced from an asking price of $500. It seems likely that Voynich made a good profit, perhaps even more than 100% of what he paid for the volume, but it took over a decade to do so. Another of the manuscripts that crossed the Atlantic with Voynich in 1925 was doing so for at least the fifth time. It has an even lower stock number, 38, suggesting that it was part of the exhibition of 1915. In 1925, it is described simply as MS Valturius, Italy, 1470, calf, and valued at £7,800. In 1929, Neil made strenuous efforts to sell the manuscript to the Morgan Library, attempting to associate it with Mantegna, Bellini, and, Ian, and even Leonardo da Vinci. The Morgan Library declined to buy. The manuscript was unsold at, Le at Voynich's death in 1930 and subsequently found its way to the Library of Congress, where it appears to be this volume with spectacular grisaille illustrations, including this one, which prompted the association with Mantegna. In this case, a high price tag presumably deterred buyers for at least 15 years. In October 1927, as Voynich's business was struggling, the American dealer A.S.W. Rosenbach published an article entitled Why America Buys England's Books in the Atlantic Monthly. He began with a stereotype. During my frequent visits to England, I have often been asked why Americans are so persistent, even voracious, in acquiring the great literary treasures of Great Britain. Voynich might have counted that he wished this were the case. Rosenbach went on to explain that American acquisition was not a problem because if the British changed their minds, they could simply buy the books back. Concluding, in a few years, it will be impossible to purchase the finest English books in London. I have only recently sold to a well-known English collector some volumes purchased at the Britwell sale not two years ago. I can foresee the day when Englishmen with the taste and ability to buy will be browsing shops in Philadelphia in New Orleans, in Minneapolis, in San Francisco, and taking their lucky finds back with them to their old home. Although this vision did not prove entirely accurate, particularly in the choice of American cities named, the Voynich records demonstrate that some manuscripts did cross the Atlantic multiple times during the 1920s. Moreover, following Voynich's death, some of his American stock was returned to London for sale at Sotheby's as the business was wound up. The cipher manuscript escaped this fate. Voynich bequeathed it to his wife Ethel and Anne Nill. After Ethel's death in 1960, Anne sold the manuscript to the dealer H.P. Krauss, who, also unable to sell it, eventually gave it to the Beinecke Library. Why does any of this matter? The Cultivate Manuscript Research Project is examining the trade in medieval manuscripts between around 1900 and 1945 to test the hypothesis that the fate of manuscripts in that period has had a significant impact in how they are understood in current scholarship and consequently on how accounts of the Middle Ages have been constructed. On a simple level, this phenomenon is the, reflected in the illustrations that I've been able to provide to this talk. Some of the manuscripts sold by Voynich to Henry Wellcome can be identified because Wellcome's accession books have been digitised, but none of the Voynich manuscripts have yet to receive such attention. In contrast, the Morgan Library provides photos of pages of its manuscripts with illustrations, reinforcing the idea of these books as works of art, a quality Voynich seems to have emphasised around the time that he sold them the supposed Giotto manuscript. The Morgan Library's size and relative accessibility to scholars from the 1920s onwards means that its manuscripts holdings are well known, 
whereas the manuscripts at the Art Institute of Chicago form a tiny part of their collections eclipsed by works in other media. Thanks to some digitization, however, together with the publicity around Voynich's visit to Chicago in 1915, these manuscripts are easier to trace than those acquired by many American universities, despite the work of Seymour de Ricci in the 1930s. The Voynich archives help to shed light on the challenges of matching unique books to unique clients. The content of a book did contribute to its trajectory, but it did so only within a shifting marketplace of collectors. Despite all Voynich's efforts to create new markets through exhibitions and lectures, many manuscripts failed to find buyers. This provides an important corrective to press reporting that suggested that America was a voracious and largely undiscerning market for European treasures in this period. Among the volumes that Voynich could not sell was, of course, the cipher manuscript. Yet the time and resources invested into advertising that manuscript in the 1920s, including the distribution of photographs and facilitating research, sowed the seeds for much of the interest of recent years, once the manuscript had finally found its home in the Beinecke Library, where it is now fully digitised. It is therefore an exemplary case of the impact of a bookseller of the early 20th century on shaping ideas about medieval manuscripts, even if many of the stories that he told about the book, like those told about him, have since been judged to be larger than life.